Think of this as a game of Monopoly. Whoever mo- owns the most physical real estate in other people's minds wins. Welcome to the show, Leslie. It's great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. John and I are huge fans of behavioral science. It's influenced our own careers. We'd love to learn what intrigued you about behavioral science and how it's influenced your career. Well, if you've ever tried to change somebody's mind, you know how incredibly hard that is. But that's what companies and brands have been trying to do for 100 years. And the traditional approach is to try to persuade the conscious mind to do what you want it to do. And that simply doesn't work. So in my book, The Power of Instinct, I teach people and organizations how to harness the instinctive mind via cognitive shortcuts. And you can use those to scale your business, your brand, your idea, your personal brand, uh, all of that much faster than going against that very resistant conscious mind. It's basically the path of least resistance to a sale. I know for many of us, we rationalize our decision-making through our conscious mind, so we often give it more power than it actually has. So it might be helpful for our audience to learn a little bit more about how the brain works and how we actually make these decisions. Our brain has two mechanisms. Our primary mechanism is actually our instinctive mind that's making decisions on autopilot all the time, and we just don't realize it. And to your point, the conscious mind is a a post-decision rationalization mechanism, essentially, uh, that comes in after the fact. But around 95% of the decisions that we make are made by our instinctive mind, which is really the opposite of what we were taught in marketing and in business school. You know, the premise is that you can control people's (laughs) decisions. You can get them to change from one brand to another, and we can basically persuade people to do what we want them to do. But the fact is that the conscious mind is very resistant to change. It is skeptical. It thinks it knows best. And it doesn't want to do what you tell it to do. That is the key reason why persuasion just doesn't work, um, because you're running up against that very resistant conscious mind. It turns out that the instinctive mind, which actually is making 95% of the decisions that we make anyway, is much more malleable. And ideas seep in there. Uh, much more easily. And so you can influence that subconscious, instinctive, non-conscious, whatever you want to call it, mind, to your advantage uh, to get people to do what you want them to do. Buy your brand, buy your idea, um, get your your partner to take out the garbage, <laughs> whatever whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Get your kid into an Ivy League school. At the end of the day, we're all marketers, even we may not think of ourselves that way, but we are all marketers. Everybody is selling something. Everybody is trying to do something with their personal brand, with their business. All of these things are within your grasp and you you actually can be empowered to be much more effective if you know these new rules of engagement. Now, there is a concept in the book that was a little unfamiliar to me and I'd love to unpack for our audience and this idea of the connectome and how we've started to study the brain recently and recognize all the connections that are happening and developing through neurogenesis. You know, the old way of thinking was you can't teach an old dog new tricks and that these pathways were wired and it was very difficult to change. But new science shows that the brain is malleable and changes quite often. A hundred percent. That that is exactly true. So what is the brand connectome? The brand connectome is the cumulative memories that have gotten sort of glued to your brand in people's minds over time, some going as far back as childhood. So if it's you know Pepsi and Coke or McDonald's, these are brands that you have many, many memories uh, attached to. And so your choice to buy one brand over another is, is very much driven by those cumulative memories and maybe even the, the, the brand that you grew up with in your, in your household that your mother served. So the brand connectome is really useful because what we now understand about it is that the larger that brand connectome in people's minds, the more people instinctively reach for that brand. Contrary to the old thinking that a brand should only stand for one thing, a a successful brand, a successful brand connectome actually has to have a myriad, an abundance of connections in your mind to, to many things 
to many things in your mind, not just stand for one thing. So if you're Volvo and you just stand for safety, you're really going to stand for too little in the mind. You also want to stand for advanced technology and a, a good appearance and um, fits your whole family and like all all of the all of the many associations. Essentially, a brand is known by the associations it keeps. It's not about your logo, your product, your package, or even your personal logo if you're a personal brand. It's about the connections and associations your brand is connected to, who your friends are, um, what platforms you go on, um, the books that you read, who your friends are. It's really all of those connections that define what a brand is. And if we're cognizant of that, we can build our brands much more successfully and much more, much more easily. You give this great example in the book uh, around the Harry Potter books and just how they grew in popularity compared to other children's stories that have very similar themes and heroes' journeys, but have not nearly reached the level of popularity as Harry Potter. That's such a, a great a great point. And um, I was fascinated by Harry Potter my, myself. I read the story to my to my uh, older son. Um, I got tired out for the second son, but. <laughs> For the first son, I w- read like the whole book from beginning to end, and and I was fascinated by it. I I thought that it was more there was more that was going on there than just that it was a coming of age story about this this kid who has magic magical powers. And to your point, there were many other stories like that out there. But what distinguishes Harry Potter from all those other books is that Harry Potter is entering a world. When you go into that franchise, you are entering the world of Harry Potter and it has cities and it has train stations and it has universities and it has sororities and fraternities, you know, the four schools, um, Slytherin, et cetera. It has, uh, it has sports. It has the Olympics, you know, Quidditch. It, it has all the many things that we have in our own world. So in, essentially, it's a mirror image of our world here. But the difference is they put a magical twist on all those things. So I kind of think of it like, here's our world, here's the Harry Potter world on top, and we have all the same connections to Harry Potter that we have in our world, which is what makes it so relevant, but with that magical twist on all those things. Um, But that's what makes it so salient in people's minds. You know, you have all these amazing positive associations um, on the sports, on the, the the sororities and fraternities, and going to university and going coming home for Christmas vacation and going on adventures with your friends, like they have all the same things, but you're just doing it in this magical way. So by having such a similarity and overlap, you can reach and connect with so many viewers and readers of that book in a way that moves them to buy your tickets to the rides to get all the memorabilia and and get so engrossed and dress up for Halloween as those characters, whereas some of those other children's books that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years don't have nearly the salience. That's right. It's a $40 million franchise when you think about the Lego games and the movies and the books and the Disney rides, like all of that um, all taken together. It's just a huge success. When you think about what is really going on here, Harry Potter has taken a seed of an idea and grown it in people's minds so that it has all these many different neural pathways. And so I think it's useful to just think about this almost like a metaphor. When you're building a brand, you're planting a seed in other people's minds and you want to feed it nutrients. And the nutrients in this case are water, sun, soil. In our in our world, this is positive associations and positive connections. And the more associations that we connect with that brand, the more that seed is going to turn into a seedling, is going to turn into a plant, it's going to put down a root system, and it's going to, you know, little by little, sprawl throughout, sprout throughout the brain so that it, it encompasses more physical terrain in the human brain. And that is really what we are doing as people who build brands. We are gardeners planting a seed and we are, we need to grow our brand in people's minds physically so that it has more touch points, more connections in other people's minds. It's not about you. It's about the connections that the brand makes 
to other people in their minds. What we really need to do is think about how do we grow that brand connectum on an accelerated pace. And that's the challenge you're you're asking me. What do I do if I'm a new brand and I need to build my brand, you know, I need to build my brand connectome overnight. And the answer to that is you actually can do it. You actually can do it. Sure, the legacy brands will always have a tremendous sort of built-in advantage. But there's a million cases of small brands in categories that have overtaken those big brands and done it very quickly. I mean, just look at Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club with one video, one 60-second video that happened to have gone viral, um, they hit all the right things, um, and they sort of targeted the bigger brands, the Schicks, the Gillettes, without naming them specifically, uh, but they called out implicitly those bigger brands by talking about all the strengths of Dollar Shave Club, all the vulnerabilities of those uh, big brands. And they had a series of what I will call triggers, which I'll define in a moment. And they packed those into that 60-second video to the point that between zero and 60, they were able to make these tremendous inroads in these gigantic legacy brands pretty much overnight. And so it is absolutely possible for a small brand uh, just starting out to take a big chunk of market share from, from a legacy brand if you have the right recipe. I think what also played in their favor is they were able to take aim at the old way of doing things. So the old way that these razors were were made, the old way that you purchased those razors, the old way that you dealt with razors, they were able to take aim and uh, choose that as its enemy, right? And, and, And show, give you a new way. Well, now this replaces those connections, right? So now I have a better way that I want to view shaving. I don't want to have to go to the store to purchase this. I do want fresh, amazing razors uh, every time that I that I shave and, and never have to worry about it. Again, that's a thing now that I don't have to think about on my grocery list. So, and everyone that came into the market uh, at that time and 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 saw the the path that was laid out in front of them because of Dollar Shave Club. I mean, it, those connections were very easy for everybody to make. Well, let, let me just say how smart that is because that's exactly what they did. What you are talking about is the fact that the brain is a relativity machine. If you're up on Pepsi, you're down on Coke. If you're up on Coke, you're down on Pepsi. And so what they created, what Dollar Shave Club created in that moment was the notion of a foil. They weren't just selling Dollar Shave Club, they were selling Dr. Dollar Shave Club against the Gillettes and the Schicks of the world. That was the foil. And the brain loves contrast. And so that's one of the most successful techniques that you can use in branding, which is to elevate your brand and simultaneously take down the other guy. And that doesn't sound very nice, but it's yeah, that's how competitive <laughs> competitive strategy works. And you can do it in a way without being overt because they were not overt in the Dollar Shave Club example. They were selling against these things, but you didn't know exactly who they were talking about. Um, but, you know, people who shave knew that they were using a Gillette razor or a Schick razor. And it was very uh, clear to them that this was a better alternative because it was cheaper, it was high quality, um, they employ people of diverse backgrounds, like all the good things that they ba- packed into that message. And you're not paying for all that innovation and creating, you know, razors that have a, an air conditioner, a hammer, a flashlight, you know, all, all of that gadgetry. Uh, you just need a simple razor. And the CEO is very relatable. And I think when you start to talk about these large incumbent brands, you know, there's a big backlash against large corporations and the owners and how much money they're making. So you see this upstart guy, he's very relatable, he's using his product and he's touting a new way to shave with fresh blades. And that resonance, of course, created the virality. And then everyone I knew at that time was buying Dollar Shave Club and talking about it. And we would host all of our clients at the house. And and so many of them at that point were using Dollar Shave that they were struggling to tell whose razors was which. A hundred percent. Yeah, no, it was a very clever strategy. He was very relatable. And even the environment that he was in, he looked like he was was in his own garage instead of like a fancy skyscraper, you know, with, with glamorous furniture, which would suggest to the consumer that you're putting your money in the wrong place. 
uh, that you're putting it in, in into the environment that you work in, uh, into fancy offices, and that the consumer is paying for that. The other thing that worked in their favor was to gather the attention that they deserved for the new product. Uh, they had disruption on their side. So a disruption of the status quo of shaving every Man knows the issues of, of shaving every day or every other day, however that goes out. So to hear that there is a disruption in your everyday routine and life, that puts eyeballs on, there's a disruption, what do you have for me? What is the big commotion? Oh, I never have to think about this ever again. I just sign here. Great. 100%. Well, I was at a, a weekend event with some friends and it was funny, you know, we grew up with the Pepsi Coke challenge, but none of my friends were drinking Pepsi or Coke. They were reaching for Olipop and Poppy and these new upstarts that are touting gut health and a lowering of sugar. So even when you are a, a mega brand that has a huge brand connectome, there are trends that you need to be following and people now looking for healthy alternatives, less sugar. We recognize the impact that all the sugar is having on us. So now we're seeing these brands enter a huge industry and take on the big dogs around this new way of viewing drinking your soda. Exactly. And every brand is vulnerable. And these legacy brands, which is actually who the majority of our clients are, these legacy brands need to constantly uh, evolve. If you're not growing and growing new branches and new uh, neural pathways in the connectome and making new connections in people's minds, then you're dying. Uh, and it's, it really is very much like a plant or a tree. I, I think about the, a brand very much that way, uh, that we have to constantly tend to our tree, constantly tend to our brand connectome to keep it healthy. And the way to keep it healthy is to reinforce the positive associations that your brand stands for. Stop the negative associations, stop those right away that get into the brand connectome that are hurting you because those hold back growth. And then add new positive associations that those new younger consumers need in order to come over that you haven't quite won over yet. Um, so it's a very simple recipe. Keep, stop, add. And that's a really good sort of um, construct for the audience to know uh, about in terms of renovating their own brands. You know, keep, stop, add. Keep the positive things you're known for. Keep reinforcing those. It's almost like studying or you study for something, you learn it better. Uh, and that's how the brain works. You can't assume that people know those things about you. You got to keep telling people, t telling new generations the good things about you. Second, you need to stop the negative associations that are creating um, barriers for the growth target uh, to come over. And then three, add positive associations in the form of triggers, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, and I want to tell you all about because I think they're super useful as a way of accelerating growth uh, of your brand. Yeah, a great example of that in the book that I thoroughly enjoyed was M&M's. So classically, I grew up on M&M's having chocolate in them, and then all of a sudden there's peanuts. But recognizing that there's a trend to snacking, M&M's capitalized on adding new ingredients that people were looking for to snack on wrapped in their candy coating, and that allowed them to stay relevant and add new connectomes as all these other upstarts were entering the market. And I thought that was a really fascinating story that you shared. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, candy is not as permissible as snacking is, right? Candy, you're going to say, oh, maybe I should only have one of those, one a week, two a week, whatever. But snacking, you do that all the time. And so the, the more that M&M's associated itself with snacking, which would be pretzels and nuts, uh, peanut butter, things that are more food-like as opposed to candy-like, uh, the more they were able to grow their franchise and develop all these different innovations and kind of surround the consumer. Now they're bridging two categories. They're in, they're in candy, but they're almost acting more like a snack. And that drives permissibility and permissibility drives usage. So let's talk about these growth triggers and how our audience can start to recognize them and then utilize them in their own brands. I use this example all the time because it's just really simple for everyone to understand. If we were in the bottled water category and you looked at a snow-capped mountain, let's play the game. What are the associations that would come to mind when you would see a snow-capped mountain in the bottled water category? Pure, crisp, refreshing, natural. 
There you go. So everybody does that. What you just did is you pull to mind all the associations that you have baked into your neural pathways, baked into your memory about Snowcapped Mountain. And the advertiser or the, the person that's selling the bottled water, they don't need to say any of those things. That's how efficient the Snowcapped Mountain is. So the definition of a growth trigger is that it's a succinct code or cue in any of the five senses, which means could be visual, could be verbal, could be olfactory, could be a smell, could be tactile, uh, could be a taste uh, trigger. But let's, for the moment, since we're talking about marketing, focus on visual and verbal triggers. So the snow-capped mountain is an image trigger, a visual trigger, because it has all these positive associations baked into it. And if I connect my brand to that growth trigger, now my brand inherits all those positive associations, pure, pristine, eco-friendly, water from the glaciers, all of these positive things, and the perceptions of my brand become elevated to the point of this is a superior bottled water. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, so imagine if I give you the 25 triggers for your brand and you pack those into your communications, into your marketing materials, or even to your conversation if you're pitching your company services, now I'm going to accelerate the growth of the brand Connectome because all those positive associations from the snow-capped mountain are going to come onto my brand. And that's essentially how this works. So you take an existing brand Connectome that may be small and, and lack salience, and you add these triggers that are packed with all these positive associations, and my brand Connectome is going to grow and sprout new pathways that it didn't have before. And now my brand is going to take over more of your mind. Think of this as a game of Monopoly. Whoever mo owns the most physical real estate in other people's minds wins. And recognizing that it then subconsciously becomes that instinctual purchase. A hundred percent. So if I have salience, if, I, if my brand has a large physical footprint in people's minds, then I'm going to instinctively reach for that. Now, if I give you a coupon or if I take a lot of money off, I can get you to buy, but it's more likely going to just be fleeting because I haven't built those neural pathways. So yes, you can go the, the conscious route and promote your brand, take price off, give people coupons, promotional incentives, rewards, all those things. I can do those things, but I'm telling you that you're not going to get sustainable growth from that. The only way to get sustainable growth is to grow that brand connectome to your point so that the, the brand footprint, the physical brand footprint is larger in other people's minds. And that is going to give me instinctive brand preference where they keep buying you over and over again. And it's the brand connectome that is making that happen. So you think you're calling the shots, you're not calling the shots. You're not choosing your brands. Your brand connectome is literally driving you to buy that same brand over and over again, and you are powerless to resist. So in thinking about from a brand's perspective, is it important to engage all five senses with triggers? How do you go about designing these growth triggers from a brand's perspective to grow? It would be great if you could have all of the five senses, but even if you just have you know two of them, the verbal and the visual, you can get a lot done. So again, I don't know what kind of business we're talking about. Do you own a brand that you're selling in stores? Is it your personal brand? Is it your business? Like, what are you selling? But in any in any of those cases, you you also want to put some of those triggers into your sort of verbal pitch um, that that you might have when you're talking about your company, your elevator pitch, or if you were even I don't know, um, you know, going up for a new job and you were talking about a job interview and you wanted to get a promotion or um, any of those things, um, these growth triggers can be super useful. And you want to just go into those situations very strategically <laughs> and knowing here are the you know five messages I want to hit and I want to have, I'm going to have growth triggers for each of those. Um, and work those into the conversations. One of the things I tell my friends, I'm, I'm not a, a job coach. That's not my job. Um, I advise brands. But 
for my friends, when they ask me, what should I do when I'm going into this job interview tomorrow, I will tell them to not let the interviewer run the interview. I tell them to come to the interview with like, here are my five messages that I'm going to get across come hell or high water. I am going, these are the things that I'm going to, that I'm going to communicate. Because if you just let them control the interview, you may not get um, the most important things across. And by the way, the worst thing you can do is to go through a resume. They already have the resume. That is so boring. That's not the job of the interview. The job of the interview is to bring yourself to life. There are a bunch of things that you want to do in, in that world. You want to have a philosophy, you know, show enthusiasm about the company. You want to you know, quote something that the CEO might have said in an, in an earnings report. Um, you want to show that you can help them achieve their goals, their vision. Um, so there are a bunch of things, and I talk about some of these in the book as well, um, that you're going to want to do to really make yourself come off that page uh, so that you're a person that they feel that they that they have to have. Because in a sense, you're building your little mini brand connectome in their mind, and you want to do that in the course of the 30-minute interview that you have. That's incredibly important important as well, because if you're just there and just doing the interview, answering the questions that they're asking, they're putting together your brand. They're putting together your story. And so if you're not interjecting, if you're not making, uh, getting your five messages in there, they don't have anything to go on. It, they're going off of what they think are, are, are the, the connections and, and the, uh, the bio connect. Uh, in their mind of what that might be. And they might have seen a hundred people that week, all with the same qualifications, uh, all sorts of things. And, 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 and the story that they're building in their mind is this is, this is another guy with the, with the, who checks the boxes, but I, I don't quite see us having beers after work or hanging out. There's no personality, uh, coming out for the interviewee to get excited about. A hundred percent. The interviewer is making a decision on instinct, just like right. everybody else. Some people say it happens in the first 30 seconds of the interview, right? Like that's scary. That's a scary statistic. But what that means is we need to put forward early <laughs> in the interview all of the kind of the key messages, get those out. It's almost like, you know, boom, 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 boom. We need to hit them with all those positive messages in almost an avalanche of positive association so that we can build the brand in their minds. And to your point, everybody creates their own narrative. Yes. Right? We're, we're constantly creating our own narrative about brands. Um, this is the biggest problem we see with the legacy brands is that they think that they've been communicating their stories but in fact, consumers have been making up their own stories about the brands. And we need to go in there and it's almost like a virus gets into the brand that, and they don't know it. So they're shocked when their brand starts to, their business starts declining. And the reason that they're shocked is because it's been baking in the unconscious mind of their growth target, the people they don't have but they don't monitor the instinctive mind regularly, right? They, they just have these very conscious brand trackers, health trackers. So they're missing a whole bunch of information. And then three years later, the business falls out of bed and they're like, oh my God, what happened? Um, and they'll blame it on the economy. They'll say it was a recession. They'll say there was a competitor that came after us, uh, or maybe the, the classic, we don't have big enough marketing budgets, but all of those things may be true, but actually the real culprit is that negative associations are brewing in the unconscious mind of your growth target that have turned into barriers. And that's why our marketing isn't working because it's going up against a brick wall. Sure. And you could think of something like uh, Harley Davidson. I mean, we all have a picture, uh, that BioConnect, of what that uh, brand is to us. I grew up in a house uh, with... Uh, with a Harley. My dad rode when I was younger. Um, and of course there was a lot of associations with the people that who would come up to, to visit uh, the band that he played in. And, and, and so well, we begin to, to build that story of what that brand is and its relation, its associations 
with us. And then, of course, if they decide to change their marketing, as Harley Davidson did, well, you can understand why it it doesn't just piss people off. It breaks their heart <laughs> because these some of these brands are almost like family. And in, in fact, they, they, uh, these families have uh, held up these brands that as and, and vice versa have held their family together. It's so true. Yeah, no, people are very passionate about their brands. Um, and as a brand steward, you have to take care of your brand. You've got to nip those negative associations in the bud. So it might be useful to just understand what makes a healthy brand. And there are three sort of basic rules for what makes a healthy brand. One, it needs to be physically large. So we talked about the large physical footprint and salience, as you pointed out so accurately. The larger it is in your brain, the more instinctively you reach for it. So that becomes your go-to. Second, you want to have a high ratio of positive to negative associations. Negative associations are the death knell of brands. That's what causes brands to decline, whether it's Bed Bath & Beyond or Sears or Toys R Us or like any of the brands that we all know have gone through um, bankruptcy. Uh, it's because negative associations uh, that were haven't been removed in that brand and they've gone on for a very long time just sitting there turning into barriers, which keeps the brand from growing. And then the third thing you need is distinctiveness. And I'm very careful not to say the word uniqueness because I think the word uniqueness should be eliminated from the English language when it comes to marketing. Um, it is a fool's errand. Um, we actually don't need to be unique at all. Rather, we are hardwired as human beings to connect with the familiar. We actually reject the unique. So we're actually pushing people away when we try to be unique. What we want to do is we want to be familiar we want to ride existing neural pathways, that's the familiar, but put a creative twist on it and make it distinctive to you, which is very different. So I'm talking about distinctiveness as opposed to uniqueness. So those are the three rules, large, positive, and distinctive. And if you keep working on those three things, then you'll have a healthy brand. Why are negative associations so strong and, and what can we do to overcome them to be persuasive? So negative associations are strong because the human brain uh, tends to listen to the negative um, probably six times more than it listens to the positive and, and click on those things more often, um, et cetera. So what we want to do when we have negative associations, and every brand has one, every, every personal brand has one, every legacy brand has one, every new, every brand has negative associations. Anybody who tells you they don't have negative associations is, you know, living, living in a, in a uh, rose colored world. Um, it's natural that they form. But what you want to do is you want to nip those on, in the bud right away. And you can't get rid of a negative associations by, by saying, no, I don't have that negative association. That's what McDonald's tried to do uh, over a decade ago when um, they were accused of having pink slime in their chicken nuggets. Um, and that pink slime, um, those YouTube videos had gone viral. So what they tried to do, um, and you can understand why they would do this, the leadership said they went out with a big advertising campaign that said, we don't have pink slime in our chicken nuggets. And of course, all that did was tell more people about the pink slime problem and the brand, the business took a further nosedive. What they finally ended up doing was going on a real food strategy where they told people how they actually make the food at McDonald's, which is incredibly sustainable. They use 100% USDA beef, like they do all the good things, uh, but nobody knew it. It was the story that was not being told. And so negative associations are very problematic because they literally stop people from buying your brand. Um, and the only thing you can do is to eliminate negative associations with positive ones. The last thing you want to do is reinforce a negative association. And those negative associations can become competitive advantages for other brands. So with that pink slime, all of a sudden you saw a real whole fresh food pervasive now in fast food on every menu. It's, it's, this is real food. This is fresh. We make it every day to highlight that misstep that McDonald's had around pink slime. That's exactly right. So negative associations become the competitive advantage of your, you know, of the other companies. And during that period, Wendy's and uh, Starbucks 
and Subway, you know, took a lot of market share from McDonald's. But they were able to turn that around. And it was really one of the most remarkable turnarounds, I think, in brand history um, because they were in trouble at that time. But they did a wonderful job of telling their story and they've been doing it ever since um, with with all the right um, messages. And, and it's really that they're just telling the truth now. Uh, and before, unfortunately, that was a great case of that the mind had created a narrative about McDonald's based on those videos that had gone viral about pink slime. And it kind of, the brand took a life on, took on a life of its own in a, in a bad way. Uh, and the brand, the business people, you know, lost control of that narrative. And then by, they finally, after a couple of years, um, took the narrative back. And now they know that they have to constantly tell their story and add those new positive associations to keep the brand healthy. So we're huge proponents of a personal brand. We've recognized in coaching our clients how it can accelerate your career, be really impactful on those job interviews, as we just discussed. It can open doors to opportunities to find jobs that aren't even posted. Recognizing the importance of a personal brand, what is your guidance for our listeners who are nervous or unsure on how to build their own personal brand? And what can we learn from the big brands to be effective in building our personal brand? Well, I love this question because I really think that we should all think of ourselves as brands, whether whether or not we actually like want to be an influencer. I mean, God forbid the, everybody decides they want to be an influencer. That would be an awful, an awful world. Um, but I would say that we all should manage our our personal brands, uh, and the way to do that is is holistically and to understand that we should not stand for one thing, that we need to stand for many things. You need to have lots of different dimensions. So you want to have a positive brand image. You want to have a positive inspirational philosophy. You want to build up your expertise. You want to talk a lot about your expertise and codify it. So it's not enough to just say, you know, I can help you. Um, Let's say you were a consultant or a coach. Um, you would want to rather be able to really explain what is distinctive about your expertise in how you do it. You want to show that your brand and your business um, applies to many different occasions, many different situations, not just one. Otherwise, you become a niche and you become small in people's minds again. You want to have a strong connection to culture. You don't want to be dated. Um, You don't want to uh, only be modern. You want to be like a combination of sort of the past and the future. I guess the last thing is don't be afraid to talk about your personal story, your personal heritage. A lot of people stay away from that. They think in business they shouldn't talk about how they got here. Um, but especially if you can connect your past to why you do what you do, um, even you know going all the way back to being a little kid, um, maybe there's something in your background that, that that you could see early on that had a connection to what you do today. That's really powerful to people. Um, it has a sense of nostalgia, and nostalgia is one of the most powerful forces in the human mind. And thinking about it like a narrative, understanding that people resonate with stories. So as we shared earlier, they're going to write that narrative about you, whether you participate in the writing or not. So that story is being written subconsciously first and then consciously when they make that decision on hiring you or passing on you or giving you the interview or not wanting to work with you. So it's important to recognize that you have a narrative. Maybe you haven't spent the time to develop it and think about all those little pathways that led to where you are now and what the growth has been to get here and then where you want to go in the future with the vision that you have for yourself and how that intertwines with the brand or the company that you want to work with. A hundred percent. And creating connections between your brand and the brand or business that you are wanting to work for, that's really interesting and really important too. Because if the, let's say, let's say it is an interview situation and you're pitching your services or even yourself, either one, you want to create a match between what they're looking for and what you provide. And so the more connections you can create between your brand and their brand, the more it's going to be an instinctive brand preference, an instinctive choice. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's important to recognize that those connections don't have to be word for word or exact. And I think that's what trips a lot of people up. 
So let's say the company is looking for growth in this particular area, and maybe you don't have direct expertise or experience in growth in that area. You highlighting growth in other areas that you've brought to previous jobs can be that connectome that they're looking for in order to hire you. So sometimes we get a little too tripped up on being exact and then not wanting to overshare areas that aren't maybe impactful in your mind. But if you can connect on the larger themes of what they're looking for in the role to what your path and narrative have been, you're much more likely to succeed on that interview. I, I totally I totally agree. And I think that's a great way to think about it. I mean, one of the things people can do is sit down and say, well, what are the five or six themes that are important to this company that I'm interviewing with um, or that I'm pitching my services to? And then jot down kind of what are the similar themes in my life or in my work that kind of fit with those. But it, uh, of course, it doesn't need to be word for word. That's far too literal. Um, we need to really start thinking on a much more implicit level in general. Now, one thing that stood out in the book that I was fascinated by is the use of fantasy in persuasion by brands and, and how impactful it is. So can you share a little bit about how brands use fantasy and why it's so persuasive? So not every brand does use fantasy, but the more successful brands do. Um, so there is, a, a again, another old saying in um, marketing that consumers want to see their reality. They want us to show them what their lives are like. If they're a busy mom, they want to see, you know, the kids screaming and, <laughs> and the house a mess. Um, and the fact is that that's not how the brain works. The brain stores memories in their idealized form. And so what we really covet is fantasy, the idealized experience that we want to have with a brand. The brands that are that do that the most, that tap into other people's fantasies, are going to be highly successful. We saw that with our clients and the Dos Equis commercials about being the most interesting man and how quickly all of a sudden Mexican beer became more popular in some circles because of that fantasy that was painted through those commercials. A hundred percent. I mean, Modelo is another example. Um, how, how is it that the entire beer category is declining, but Modelo is growing double digits? Um, because it is, it, it taps into the fantasy of, you know, hard work and making it, um, and, you know, really pushing yourself, the fighting spirit, uh, and they have those wonderful gold crests, gold lions and, uh, gold foil on the wrapper. I mean, it, it really is a, a whole fantasy experience that halos onto the beer, whether or not that beer is the best. I'm not, I don't know if it is or it isn't. It, do, it almost doesn't matter. But the perception is that it's superior beer because of all of the uh, accoutrement and all of the cues that they use that halo positively over that brand. It's really fascinating when you start to see these patterns in, in real life and your experience and, and recognizing when we are being influenced and persuaded by branding and then using it and leveraging it in your own life to then gain, whether it's that job or opportunities and recognizing the patterns and, and how persuasive they can be. And two that you highlight in the book are the use of humor and metaphor to allow people to, to come to your side, to actually persuade them to make that choice. Yeah, those are two excellent techniques. Um, they just need to be used very carefully because I would say that today humor is overused in marketing and in advertising, and very often it doesn't build business. And I've seen more of that than, than the successful use of humor. But when humor is used well, it is in service of dramatizing the benefit of the brand. So if the humor is locked to what you're trying to communicate and helping to communicate that, then the humor is going to work really well. And metaphor is one of my favorite things in the world. Um, metaphor is basically creating something um, that's familiar, writing an existing familiar pathway and talking about your brand in, in relationship to that metaphor. So a great example of that is when Heinz Ketchup wanted to communicate that it's not a processed condiment, but that it actually has real tomatoes inside. And so they took that wonderful glass bottle and they sliced it up like a tomato and put a little green stem on the end. And suddenly, without any words, we create the association in our own heads that Heinz ketchup is like fresh sliced tomatoes. 
And that's just a wonderful example of how you can use a metaphor as a growth trigger to help build your business. Instinct is one of the most powerful forces for changing behavior and harnessing it can really empower you to do anything that you want to do in life. Uh, Build your brand, your business, your idea, a social cause. Um, It's really the key to moving things faster in your life and um, going the path of least resistance instead of the path of greatest resistance uh, to what you want to achieve. So I hope that people will enjoy the book uh, and I hope people will use some of these rules because it's kind of a primer on how you can learn all of this and save the 30 years that I spent (laughs) learning all of it and um, use it to your own advantage. Uh, And I hope people will be really successful with it. Well, thank you for giving our audience an unfair advantage. Where can they find out more about the book and the work that you do, Leslie? Um, Well, the book is available on Amazon um, and Porchlight and Barnes & Noble and all the the bookstores. Uh, It was published by Hachette. It's super exciting. We've got some really great um, Amazon reviews. Uh, And uh, my company is Triggers Brand Consulting. uh, And you can find me on LinkedIn, Leslie Zane. Um, And yeah, I'd love, would love to meet you. Well, thank you for stopping by. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great conversation.